There's a whole tradition I was taught growing up. There was a notion that in order to understand the world, I had to understand the nature of myself. That there was a way through devotion to find certainty. people say that angels, the highest beings right next to the absolute, right next, but they can't go over. The only way they can go over is to fall, become a human and work their way, gain enlightenment, and then they can go. Who knows how long it will take? But on the road to enlightenment, things get better and better and better. Our message is the same age-old message of life we have taught in the world for a half a century. You have to practice transcendental meditation, and with regular practice you will know what bliss means. You know what bliss means. The time is coming in my reign, in the reign of the global country of world peace now, time is coming. The whole atmosphere of life will be in the ways of bliss. Life will be ocean of bliss. It's very soon, it's going to be very soon now. It's going to be soon now, it's going to be soon now. Time, as you know, is, is huge. And then one point in that time, well, I never thought I would go to India. And here I was at Maharishi's uh, funeral ceremony um, with thousands of people. I'd always heard about uh, dipping in the um, sangam was so special. And here I am in the Ganges. Almost the precise moment some of Maharishi's ashes went in. This is a special moment in time. 
I came back, I felt different, but I don't know how again. I, 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 but I, I felt I was so glad to have gone. You know, it's, um, it's like they say, that you got a dream last night, and you're going to tell me your dream. You can tell me in words, but you can't give me the experience that you had. Maybe that's the best way to start. The funeral is like the beginning of a long dream. Five years later, I was still waking up on trains in India. Maharishi had been a figure in my mind since I was four. That's when I was initiated into his meditation practice. It was a simple technique, and from it he created a movement. I was part of a generation born to his followers, educated in his schools, and raised with his vision. paradise that hadn't arrived yet. After his death, at the site of his cremation, they began erecting a temple a monument devoted to that vision. Ideas that he developed over decades. He began in the 1950s, teaching meditation one-on-one, -on -one, promising personal enlightenment. But later, his programs became more elaborate, teaching a way of life with a plan to create heaven on earth. By the time of his death, at the age of 90, he left millions of meditators worldwide and a core of followers overseeing institutions, foundations, and trusts worth billions. I'm no longer a part of the movement. I understand meditation, but something remains mysterious to me. When I met David that day in the waters of the Ganges, I recognized something I'd seen before. Maharshi had given him something, answered a need, inspired and directed him. And I realized that was a mystery I wanted to understand. How would it all happen? And how would it continue after Maharishi's death?
first thing that I recall was him talking about that there's two aspects of life. There's the relative aspect of life, which we're aware of, that's changing like waves on the surface of the ocean. But then Maharishi said that there was a level that, that supported it. If something is ever changing, then there has to be the element of ever, what allows the ever changing to take place. So he talks about absolute relative. I found it very fascinating. But mainly I like the meditation. I actually, I remember my first meditation, June 28, 1969, when I had the experience of actually transcending, of actually diving within significant natural experience. The first thought that came to mind was, I'd like to teach this to children. I've been teaching transcendental meditation full time since 1972. Never had another job. The purpose of the foundation from the beginning was to make meditation available to any child in the world who wants it. And um, I'm, I'm an amateur at this. I'm just, you know, I'm a meditation teacher who has worked with David for three and a half years. We've done some cool things, you know, at Lincoln Center, and now all of a sudden, hundreds of schools want our programs, and Paul McCartney says he's going to do something, and I'm gonna be much better in the future in, in under, I'm learning as I go, and so that's... It's the best way to learn. Yeah. You know, like all of a sudden you're just doing it. Right. This thing has gone around the world. It was in the NewYorkTimes.com website today about the show. I mean, it's going to build. We can try that too. But uh, we just want to maximize the publicity on this. It's an uh, expensive thing for the David Lynch Foundation to put on this event at Radio City. I mean, like, beyond belief. And I think it would be very cool to try and get some feature on David's foundation, on the work that he's doing, on the research on meditation, how far meditation has come from when it was a hippie thing or a fad 40 years ago. Hold on. Bob Ross. And Marshy himself, who started the whole thing, passed away a year ago, and everybody was sort of saying, well, what's going to happen? Is TM, is meditation dead? I mean, I think there's going to be huge interest in this from the press, from that historical perspective. Oh, we need a good picture of Paul McCartney that he approved, for example. That has, a request has gone in for that, and we'll get it as soon as we get it. Paul went to India with the other Beatles in uh, spring of 1968. And their music, the White Album, Bob Ross, everyone says that just changed everything. I'll call you back, Chris. So um, that is an issue that they were wondering. And now, really, it's amazing. Paul is going to headline a benefit concert for the David Lynch Foundation at Radio City Music Hall. What you have to start to think about with an event like you're about to have is the branding of it and the opportunity to have this become an annual event and a staple for your foundation and for the city of New York. Right. And you have that potential. I feel nature's giving us that opportunity. Are you kidding, Paul McCartney? The other thing was to have, hey Tom, David Lynch put together a five minute video. All right, bye bye. With Marishi and the Beatles from the 60s. Because our baby boomers remember that. I mean, that's how I first heard about it. Are we ready? Yep. Can I see it one more time? Thinking back on it, it was a time, for me at least, at Berkeley. Berkeley was called University of California at Berserkley, and it became sort of a center of foment. Just chaos everywhere. Army in the streets, helicopters with tear gas, marches in the streets against the war, marches in the streets for civil rights. 
there were no rules, there were no role models, there was no mentors. And if there was wisdom, it's been assassinated. President Kennedy has been killed, Malcolm X has been killed, Martin Luther King has been killed. I, I, I sort of lost. In the midst of all this, Maharishi's name keeps coming up. So I went to the Berkeley TM Center, and I really liked what I had to hear. It was like, wow, here's a meditation. It was just for anybody. So I learned it. meditation helped and I remember thinking gosh nobody should have to be that confused if they can learn to meditate early on David love it <laughs> great just David 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 the whole thing I, I, you just need to know that it is so great and somehow somebody has to introduce this by saying you did this because it is so good. It was just just beautiful. I, I will tell you, and it, it's just my, can I just tell you that, you know how you say you're listening to music and then it's just like, it works and then my feeling level on just one part. Okay. At the very end, I was concerned that, now I could be wrong, there was an, there's like an intimacy when it goes in so close on Marishi uh -huh. and his hand. And I watched it twice and there was just something in my heart that just went, was like, for me, everything else was transcendental and abstract and subtle, but this was very, it just, it, 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 um. What shot? It's the one where you go in close on Marishi's face and then his hand. No, I love it. I think it was just a, just a moment too long or something. I'm trying to figure out what it was. Do you mind me even saying this? No, I like the fact that you are so discerning. You know, that's like the, the Hansa. You know, the swan can discern milk from water. But am I not expressing this thing correctly? But I, I just, you know, you know, his hands are moving. No, no, no. I actually think, I, I thought it almost got religious at the end. I see. We don't want it to get religious or preachy or... You think it was the hands. Maybe that was, maybe it was the hands. I don't know, Dave. Well, I'm going to take that to heart, Bobby. And um, we're going to fix it. Are you, like, getting really annoyed that I'm saying this? No, Bobby. <laughs> you could. I'll shorten the hands, Sean. But now tell me what's new with you, Dave. Well, um, I'm doing maybe one watercolor a day. I'm a real practical person. I'm a really down-to-earth person. I'm not prone to, you know, too much poetry. And uh, the world is very sophisticated. And so the events that come along and the knowledge of consciousness has to be presented in a way that is familiar and comfortable. It's not like it was in the 60s or early 70s. I really think that the training we've had for Marsha was for this time. Pre-cable at 8 o'clock, so that those, what was it, 4 and 3, right? 6 and 4. 6 and 4. The 6 and 4 guys can start doing the cables right at 8 o'clock, which will help us up, so when the truck... But for what I'm trying to do here, there's no place I'd rather be. I think that's it. You want to walk? Let's go see it. Huh? Because we could set up something back there for I love the energy. I love the amazing people here. Everybody's so much access. But let's just go through this. I just want to... And it's interesting that there's more people learning Transcendental Meditation in New York City than in any other city in the world. This is great. This is great. This is really great. I just love it. So I feel comfortable. Really good. Yeah. Are we done? Yeah. Is that it? Right, 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 right. And the separate ICC options.
I remember the last person who you know you think would be a monk. But I am today who I am because of the meditation, which I got from Maharishi and he got from his teacher. And so ultimately the credit goes to that tradition of teachers. Right now, let's work from this because it's actually easier. The additional um Right. Okay. So tell me well, just tell me numbers because I squeeze to fit your numbers. Okay. Right, that's, that's I mean my whole life has been meditate and do what I know to be right. It doesn't take many people. Maybe one or two people could change the world. One or two people could, who have the resources could give the money that changes everything. While you do that, I'm gonna make a quick phone call. But don't go away. Hello? Dave? Bob? Just wanted to tell you one thing. Paul started crying when he watched your thing. What? Paul, when he was so overcome by emotion, he started crying when he watched your film. intuitive feeling that we all have that the Paul McCartney concert is just the tip of the iceberg and it's just a you know just a hint of what's to come Bob Roth, and I'm the Vice President of the David Lynch Foundation, and it's a special honor for me to welcome you to this news conference, inaugurating a global campaign to teach one million at-risk youth to meditate. Anyway, over 40 years ago, uh, we ended up in Rishi Cash. And that's where we met. Well, it wasn't where we met. It's where we hung out with Maharishi. And since then, I have meditated. And, uh, you know, it's a, something no one can take away. It was a great gift that Maharishi gave us. For me, it came at a time um, when we were looking for something to kind of stabilize us um, in the, towards the end of the crazy 60s. And um, it is, it's a lifelong gift. And I think it's a great thing. I think it's a particularly great thing what, what David and the foundation is doing, allowing kids to um, experience something that I don't think they otherwise would have had the chance to experience. I think it's a great thing. Now it's actually coming into the mainstream. Uh, so thank you, David, for you, putting it together. Thank you, David. David, you got 6,000 people filing into Radio City Music Hall. How are you feeling right now? <laughs> I'm floating in the twilight zone right now, Bobby. I'm feeling very good, though. It's a beautiful thing. It's a great bunch. Such a great guy, this Paul McCartney and Ringo, and all the musicians on the stage tonight have really opened their hearts to this. <laughs> and, and if it wasn't for Bobby, this thing wouldn't have happened. Congratulations to you, Bob Roth. <laughs> Dave, congratulations. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>
cosmically conscious. All the musicians came out on the stage. It's a song that Paul wrote when he was in Rishikesh, and he said he introduced it by saying when he was with Maharshi in Rishikesh, Maharshi always talked about cosmic consciousness, how everyone should live cosmic consciousness, and Maharshi kept saying about everything, such a joy, such a joy. So those are the words, cosmically conscious, fantastic song at the end of the concert. Hello. I want to change the world, so I think that we need to do this all around the world. So I hope that's the next step, that we'll do something on a, on a global scale. Everybody, I feel, has this thing. When they're by themselves, in their thoughts, are they really happy? That's when you feel it. During that time, when I was making my first feature, Eraserhead, I had every single thing I thought I'd ever want. And I should have been happy, but I felt hollow. And uh, it brought out a lot of anger and fears. And then I heard a phrase, true happiness lies within. It had a ring of truth, that phrase. And I wondered, where is this within? Maybe thinking within your body somewhere. Maybe it's in your heart. I, I gotta get that. And so I've been meditating 36 years. It's the most beautiful thing. And a lot of times it's connected to memories. It feels like a memory and it's not necessarily a memory that you, you actually maybe had. It's strange. Bliss. It's beautiful. Intelligence, creativity, energy, love, happiness, peace.
transcending is the thing that's missing from life today. That's the thing that will change everything. It's um, somewhat storytelling, and it has to be a certain way in my mind, and um, I don't know how you would describe it, but um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it pleases me. Everybody's opinion is valid. There are some people that know more intellectually than others. But even someone who doesn't know still gets an, the experience and can think and dream about that. Where do I go? Uh, hello. Well, um, I, one reason I started uh, meditation. When you expand consciousness and experience the deepest level of life, anxiety and stress and tension sorrow and depression, hate, anger, and fear begin to lift. So you live and work with so much more freedom. And you grow in that. The creativity flows more and more and more. I think meditation is a personal thing, uh, and I would stay at home and work. Yet, somehow, it started to get important to speak to people. Bobby drags me out every now and again, and these tours started. So I feel somehow um, this, <laughs> this thing got started then. I don't know quite how it happened, but out we went, one place after another. Hello. Thank you. That's very beautiful. Thank you very much.
piece of it. I want to thank everyone very, very much for coming here this evening. And David and I have traveled all over the United States. We've traveled all over Europe, Israel, Brazil. We just came from Moscow. It's a beautiful place. But nowhere have we felt as warm a reception as here in your beautiful city. Please join me in welcoming the great David Lynch. I don't like talking, um, but you know, you know, I tell him what I learned from Maharishi and some experiences. Will the day be coming soon when we can travel anywhere in the world and meet friends, not enemies? That is what is going to dawn, that light of freedom, that light of invincibility, that light of integrated world consciousness is going to be right and your contribution will be appreciated by all the people. This is the filmmaker of the age of struggle and strife, transforming it into a peaceful world. Art doesn't do a thing to change anything. And I think cinema can give people great experiences. But it will not change the world. They say if you want to change something, you have to get it from the deepest level. And this is something I'm very interested in doing. To tell people that there is a thing called enlightenment. And that we human beings can unfold that enlightenment. It doesn't take everyone uh, to believe it. But it takes some to believe it. And if we work, we have peace on earth and enlightened human beings. It sounds too good to be true. It sounds like pie in the sky. It sounds like mumbo jumbo, some kind of Eastern weird thing. But it's true and it's very good. But why is the meditation spread commercially? If it can if it's not spread commercially. It's not a religion, it's not a cult, and it's not a commercial enterprise. It's all about enlightenment for the individual and peace for the world. Beautiful, beautiful things. Um, good will overcome evil, for sure. And Russia is, I think, the greatest proof that things are getting better and better in the world world is coming together. Peace has got a chance. Dear press of Ukraine. You have a chance to bring this technique to the people, to the schools. And you will be heroes to the people. Before I go in front of people, it's a real nightmare. But after the events are over, I've got a real high 
because the feeling in the people is so good when they hear this news. It's really good. I sure never saw it getting like this. Did you? Getting this Me? thing? <laughs> no, Would I have what? said yes? <laughs> <laughs> I just so naive. So stupid. No. <laughs> I said sure. The reluctant. I call him the reluctant yogi. He's the reluctant yogi. I'm very reluctant. I would not want a repeat of, of this. It's too much torment. And now you got to be booked for this afternoon, another one. No, I don't have you booked. God has it. <laughs> did, you, did you conceive the idea for the foundation? Was yes, it? Bobby did. Yeah. Yes, he did. I don't remember. I remember it as a co collaborative thing, but I sure never saw it getting like this. I take these for Maharishi. Goodbye. It was hard keeping up with Bobby and David. I'd lost track of all the events and tours. But I realized they were changing the movement. Through the work of the Foundation, since 2008, they have initiated almost as many new meditators as Maharishi in his first decade, when he first started teaching. But their presentations seem to me a radical change from the movement I grew up in. Traveling with Bobby and David reminded me of my uneasiness with the past. Maharishi once said that when he left India in 1958, he thought it would take 10 or 12 years to free the world of problems. In those years, he toured the world 13 times, bringing his technique to 50 countries. But by the 70s, there was a change in his focus, shifting from the individual to group meditation, a collective goal. He proclaimed 1975 to be the first year of the Age of Enlightenment. In that time, I was still on the individual, individual development of full potential. And then I thought, proclaim the supreme goal of achievement of heaven on earth. That means all weaknesses from individual, from, from nations, they should go, and the main tool to accomplish it is group practice and group influence on the collective basis. In 1973, Maharishi chose Fairfield, Iowa, a town of 9,000, as the site of his university and school. By that time, over a million people had learned how to meditate, and one-third of his followers were in the United States. The new center in Fairfield attracted people from all over the world who came to study and meditate twice a day. I hadn't been back in over a decade, 
My family had long since moved away. Popular interest had declined. But we had been a part of the wave of enthusiasm, around 3,000 people at its peak. I remember it was like arriving to the promise of something new for our family, but also for the world. Speaking on behalf of Maharishi International University, we feel that great fortune and that great intuition that has placed us here in the very center of our own life, in the very center of life, in the very center of creation, in the very center of the universe, and in the very center of world history. And the great and very real mechanics of coherence that we will generate from here will fully establish and perpetuate the Age of Enlightenment for all mankind, for all time to come. Nineteen seventy nine was Maharishi's year of all possibilities. He ordered two immense domes to be built for group meditation. They were told it would take over two years, but they inaugurated the first dome after only three months. When the evaluation team of the accreditation board came to visit when they saw the dome construction and they asked us when we were going to complete it and we told them January 12th. <laughs> they told us that it was impossible. And yet here we are in the impossible. And that came about, as we know, through the foundation and organizing power of pure knowledge, pure consciousness. And there were hundreds of people who cooperated at every level in making this impossible thing possible. I'll congratulate the governors of the Age of Enlightenment in all their hard and devoted labor that they have raised. The first dome in these cornfields of Fairfield, <laughs> which will continue to purify world consciousness day after day and week after week and month after month and year after year, generation after generation. It's going to prove a blessing for the whole mankind, eh? and this will be the pride of fair field. Good, huh? You'll soon start flying here. Hmm. When I moved to Fairfield, the domes had just been completed, and groups were meditating regularly with the hopes of creating heaven on earth. It was 1982. I was 12 years old, and for me, Fairfield was high school. We were one of the first graduating classes. Soon everyone on earth is going to live like the angels in heaven. It'll be just like in the ancient times, as described in the Ramacharita Manas of Tulasi Das. In the times of Ram, the glistening palaces were so lofty that they touched the sky with their pinnacles. Everyone had a flower garden, blossoming as though it were perpetual spring. Everyone was happy. There was no one who suffered from bodily pains, ill fortune, or evil circumstance. No one was in poverty, in sorrow, or distress. No one ignorant or unlucky. No one even dreamt of sin. Now, such a time 
is coming to the world again. Heaven on earth is coming because there exists in the world at this moment, uniquely, in this modern stressed age, a great rishi just like those ancient rishis of those legendary times. And that is our dear founder and our teacher, His Holiness Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. For 30 years, Maharshi has been working, and now heaven on earth is coming. America and the Soviet Union are becoming friends, and all of you graduating today have a beautiful and peaceful future. It was hard to come of age under the weight of those expectations. By 16, I was pursuing the promise of enlightenment. Of our small class, my best friend Michael was the most devoted, and he inspired my own dedication to the program. Being on the program meant that we meditated for two hours a day, studied Vedic literature, and most importantly, banished any kind of negativity from our thoughts, focusing on the sweet truth. It gave us a sense of purpose, but for me, it was also a period of doubt. And my crisis of faith came when my friend Michael had a freakish bicycle accident that left him in a coma. He has never fully recovered. Our next address is by Sebastian Lang. I would like to dedicate this rite of passage to a very special friend, Michael Barbas. He is like no one I have ever met. He has a presence about him that brings peace. Michael has not been with us this, this year, but he will be, he has been, and he will be in our hearts always. Michael's accident changed my ideas of enlightenment and the promises that came with it. Paradise seemed incomplete, and the doubts became important to me. There is a state of consciousness which sees all this change and then there is another state of consciousness completely unassociated with change. And each has its own philosophy. That is why we can't think of only one philosophy. We must be open to different uh, understanding and experiences. Stories change, the realities change with changing consciousness. At 18, I moved away to New York City. I've lived outside the movement for over 20 years now, but there's always been questions that remained in the back of my mind. 
I can only wonder at the faith and certainty I saw in Bobby and David. How they'd given themselves over to this vision that seemed so removed from a world full of problems. The knowledge he brought out, the wisdom, the love, phenomenal. I, I, and his laugh, his face, his hands, everything about him I just loved. Now, you don't have to love Maharishi to practice Transcendental Meditation, but I did. David, one final question. What are some of your plans for the future? Well, I am going to make a film on Maharishi uh, now, and uh, we're going to start this film uh, with a trip to India uh, in early December. And we're going to go to many, many places uh, where Maharishi and his teacher Gurudev uh, went and taught. And uh, it should be uh, quite an experience. And I won't know what that is till it's finished. So that's, this will start the film. Dave? Uh, Dave, how are you? Bobby, I'm good. Are you happy about what do you want to do? What's the next step on that? Well, you know, I started thinking about stuff, and I'm reading about full enlightenment, heaven on earth, and I had written down total knowledge. Yeah. Um, it needed a Maharishi to revive the complete knowledge and provide a practical program for everyone to enjoy heaven on earth. This film is about total knowledge. <laughs> I have the solution to all problems in the world, whether it's on the individual level, or on the governmental level, or on the, on the international level. So here I am sitting with all the wisdom and all, and I'm seeing my own generation in the world is being torn apart. It's just nothing other than ignorance. And I'm trying from my level as much as I can to eliminate this ignorance. I have formulated Vedic science and Vedic technology from the ancient traditional Vedic literature. And if people take to it, we'll create a better world. If this generation fails to do it, next generation is going to, to take to it. David's documentary would start by retracing what little we know about Maharishi's early life and the man to whom he was devoted, Guru Dev. It is said that Guru Dev lived in a cave for over a decade, renouncing the material world for the spiritual. In 1941, he was made Shankaracharya of the North, Hindu spiritual leader, until his death in 1953. Maharshi served as his personal secretary. That was the time when Shankaracharya used to come out on great processions. Hundreds of people surround him and all this uh, great, a great commotion. In one of the processions I happened to see him. And when I saw him first time, I said, now fine, this is it. That was the flash to me. He just expressed the totality of nature 
and all the tradition of masters. No? And it, the footprints of their, uh, their footprints in time that have been guiding me to go ahead and go ahead. of teaching transcendental meditation in the name of Gurudev. And everything about the movement is all in the name of Gurudev. The plan of his life was to make everyone happy. After Guru Dev died, Maharshi went into seclusion for two years. Guru Dev was from a Hindu tradition which held that spiritual liberation could only be achieved by disciples who followed their master's ascetic practice. But when Maharshi re-emerged, he broke with that tradition and began teaching a simplified form of meditation to anyone who wanted to learn. David spent two weeks following Maharshi's first steps into public life, looking for traces of history. I'm going from one place to another, and each place figures into the history of Maharishi in India. But my feelings on it, I don't have any, you know, uh, cosmic, you know, revelations, you know, right. to tell you about. Right. And I, you know, it's like when I came to Maharishi's funeral, I didn't really realize till a week later maybe that I felt different right so I don't know what this trip will really what it really means and I don't know exactly how it will come together it's hard to make a film about what things really mean David's film remains unfinished but I started to understand my own film with Bobby and David here at the Leela Hotel in Delhi. And so we wake up the next morning and we go... This is where my train journey began. Two and a half hours is the drive. Way, is the drive. Now there's another place where it all started, which is the Amar Kantak Mountains, where Guru Dev was in silence for 20 years. They say in the literature that Guru Dev took his final initiation from his master and went into the forest. And that, there he spent years and years and years in silence. My brother said it's gorgeous. Did you hear about the story of the cave? Um, what is no, the story? Yeah. Which, which cave? Then? The cave that Gurudev okay. spent a lots of time. A very right. special cave. If you tried to go into that cave, bees would come out of nowhere and attack you. 
You would not go in that cave. Yeah, but Sebastian, he would. No, <laughs> you, you, there's a lot of you know highly evolved sadhus or sannyasis who said I'll be able to go there. I, I've been with Gurudev and all this. They go there, the bees come. No one goes in there. Is, is, is that something that interests you? Of course. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I just, think it would be cosmic for you. Yeah. That's the final piece, Sebastian. Well done. Cool. You will yeah. complete the story okay. if you do those things. I was kind of fascinated with David's commitment to the mythology. <laughs> because it's the source of the whole thing. How was your lesson? So good. Going to the cave just seemed to make sense. You know, ideas come from the world and Stories, all these art forms throughout time reflect the world in some way. It's so interesting. Some people are sitting poolside, sipping some fantastic drink, and not too far away, a family is suffering and, you know, wondering if they're going to make it through the night. And it's just the way the world is. It's part of the trip. There's lots and lots of torment. There's, you know, beautiful feelings in the air. It's such a great mixture. All kinds of strange relationships going on. That's what makes the story interesting. You just have to understand the thing. And that's the trick. and David in Delhi and then went east by train to Bhopal and from there I took a train north to the Amara Kantak forest and that took about two and a half days. Huge difference in just a few years. And now it's a night and day. What we've been doing is really educating people. And so people now recognize this is a survival charity. That it's as important as a good job, shelter, food, water. The problem is enormous, and there are no other solutions to violence except give every child the experience of calm and peace within.
Anyway, so I want to talk to you about TM, which I have now been doing um, 41 years. And I can see from the faces who does it and who doesn't do it, by the way. And look at your bed when you get out of it. What does it look like? It looks like a war went on in there. And you took the fight from your day into the bed. But you're fighting all day, you're fighting all night. You need a break, folks. You need a break. That's what TM is. Thank you very much. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Really great. Is a good turnout. Really yeah, good. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So yeah. who are those people? Those are hedge fund people and people in entertainment. It's and they're, really why good, are they here? Really good because they're finding out about TM and they're or they already meditate, bought fifty thousand dollar tables. With, uh, so in the next three minutes, we are going to fund the salary of TM teachers to fund one teacher for one year at the fifty thousand. Do I see a hand over there? That's one right there. Thank you very much. That's two right there. That's one. That's two. Is there no one over there? That's three right there. That's three teachers. How the heck about that? Thank you. That's $150,000. We just put three teachers in the field for a year. That is remarkable. Thank you. Said we want to raise the money to teach a million kids to meditate. We raised $1.3 million from the Radio City concert. We've now taught uh, over 500,000 youth all over the United States, throughout Latin America, Middle East, Africa, and Asia. We're now working to bring Transcendental Meditation to veterans and victims of domestic violence. We're in prisons, uh, Indian reservations. It's kind of astonishing. Pressure, the responsibility that we feel now is just to so, generate the income, the support. Welcome, David. <laughs> Thank you very much. And you all are doing such great work. It's so beautiful. And all the work you guys are doing will hasten the day when students get uh, enlightenment in school and the world gets peace. Peace. Ideas come all the time. Some of them I fall in love with. The idea tells you everything. It comes alive and you follow that and stay true to that. Stay true to the idea. Thing is very simple. That is the reason why uh, everyone succeeds in it. Any activity has a tendency to settle down and be quiet. This natural tendency 
to be quiet is all that we use in meditation. So we take a thought and experience it, thinking of a word devoid of meaning. We don't know the meaning, we don't try to know the meaning. Meaning is a static thing. If the mind is not on the meaning, then there is a chance of experiencing the sound. And then it dies out. The mind is left by itself without any sound to experience. This is a silent state of the mind. And it is so fulfilling that the mind cherishes that. So, through practice, it becomes one's own personal experience throughout life. It took a couple of days to actually find the cave. I asked the locals for directions. Everybody had an answer, but nobody knew where it was. I had to make my way on foot, 
And finally I found a Baba or a sage in the forest. He was the only one who knew where the cave was. He told me a pilgrim had been there two weeks before and been swarmed by bees and ended up in the hospital. He didn't want me to go. And I felt a bit uncertain. <laughs> 